Aquilo lá é um, é um palco de terror. O cheiro lá dentro é pesado. Já experimentaram? Isso aqui é só uma galeria. É o sofrimento. É o sofrimento da cadeia. É o sofrimento. A cadeia no Brasil foi feita para pobre. Entupido aí. É um sistema barato para o governo, é um sistema barato para o Estado. É um sistema caro para a sociedade. Tudo que se define lá dentro vai reproduzir aqui fora e vai influenciar na vida de toda a sociedade. Atira! período cumprido na prisão, que poderia funcionar muitas vezes para que essa pessoa tivesse uma chance na sua reinserção, não funciona para isso, né? Esse sistema é fábrica de bandidão. Quer fabricar bandidão? Eu conheço muitos que entraram aqui como guri chorão e que hoje não. Crack. Que pior princípio é crack. O preso que aqui está, ele veio dessa sociedade e... Se nós não tratarmos ou não tentarmos fazer com que ele seja uma pessoa melhor, não existe pena perpétua no Brasil. Ele vai voltar para essa sociedade. Aquilo lá é um... Ok, done. <laughs> Stop sharing my screen. Okay, so this is the trailer of the documentary. We had to use the closed caption, so sometimes it's not that accurate, but I think, I hope that you had the time to watch the, tra the whole documentary beforehand, because I think it could be better for this whole discussion, okay. Um, so for to start now, we would give some time to Tatiana and Renato and uh, Luca to talk. Uh, you have like five to 10 minutes to, basically bring any ideas that you want to so just to refresh so tatiana uh, is a journalist is a photographer is a very awarded documentary filmmaker and she's currently managing uh, a managing partner uh, of panda films and falange productions in brazil so she's producing uh, documentaries like short ones as well and the tv series uh, in, back in Brazil. Uh, Renato is a journalist, a writer, a screenwriter, filmmaker. He also has a collection of awards with his work and he, wore, he wrote the book Falange Gaúcha that inspired this documentary. And we have here also Luca Alverdi, who is a producer, editor, a screenwriter with more than 30 years of experience. In the last five years, I understand he's working with Renato Tatiana, especially with future and, and, and short films and also TV series. So thank you, uh, the three of you, for joining us today. I'm going to give you now the floor so you can talk a bit. I'm going to let you know when we are approaching 10 minutes. Is that all right? Feel free to unmute yourselves. Well, my English is not very good. Uh, I don't know if I can uh, tell, but um, I'm a journalist. I'm, uh, I start 30 years ago uh, like, uh, like a journalist in Brazil. And uh, the first thing uh, that uh, oh, I, you know, I intend to, to make the central is just because I um, I I cover uh, I cover the mochin uh, that that mochin that uh, we show in central in night form here it, it was the worst mochin. Uh, that happened in, in Brazil, I think, because all Porto Alegre, uh, all people, uh, lots of people <laughs> from muitas pessoas. I will, uh, I think I will speak in Portuguese and uh, have translators better. <laughs> uh, que in uh, in 94 a gente fez cobriu esse motim eu como fotógrafa. Uh, and, uh, e o Renato como jornalista, é, é como repórter da Zero Hora, 
uh, e a partir daí que a gente uh, decidiu, o Renato começou a escrever um livro e a gente decidiu fazer, em 2008, o filme uh, central. Começamos pelo Poder Entre as Grades, que era completamente baseado no, no filme central, quer dizer, no, no motim, né? E... Uh, ok, então so she started em 94, covering uh, this motim that happened here in Brazil, and now uh, she and Renato started working together, and they they have done uh, so many movies together, and they are starting to work better with the prisons here in Brazil, and um, and uh, we decided in the first time. Uh, in, in, no primeiro momento, nós fizemos o Poder Entre, a, entre as Grades, em 2008, que foi um curta-metragem, uh, que é totalmente baseado no livro que o Renato escreveu, Falange Gaúcha, que falava muito sobre esse motim de 94, né, e os resultados dele. Ok, então so e Renato have done a, a short movie together that is all based on his book, and... Um, and, uh, and after we do this uh, short movie, short movie uh, we start uh, making the central uh, for no uh, for uh, show the um, uh, the reality the reality of um, prison in Brazil uh, because central is the worst. Uh, and the bigger uh, in prison in Brazil. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, Luca, do you want to add anything? Um, I will try to, to say something relevant, but I have <laughs> to tell you that I am the less important in this trio because I arrived uh, at the end, of, almost at the end of the, the, pro the process. And I know Tatiana since 2009. Uh, I edited several movies uh, with Panda Films in Porto Alegre, and immediately I understood the the, <laughs> the greatness of uh, Tatiana because of his um, engagement in uh, social causes, and uh, that's the reason why she asked me uh, later on in 2015 to participate in this project. And then I was really impressed. I was astonished because uh, I met um, um, our dear friend Renato, and uh, I understood that he's one of the greatest journalists in southern Brazil. And um, that's uh, okay. I understood that they put their lives in risk because of this kind of activity. So I, I had to make a choice. I decided to join. And um, I had 120 hours of rushes filmed along the four years almost. And it was um, a very big uh, challenge to go in deep uh, all this uh, material. I had to, to talk with a lot of people because I'm not Brazilian, you know, and I didn't know anything about this kind of reality. I have to try to figure. And um, I think that um, we succeeded. We succeeded we, because we are. We created a, a very big team. We are very friendly and uh, we are comrades, basically. And that's it. I don't want to say anything at all. <laughs> if you have some uh, questions, I will uh, try to answer. Thank you so much for your attention. OK, so thank you so much, Tatiana and uh, Luca, uh, for this and for joining us today. Uh, and uh, I know the language is a challenge and we admire you for doing that, you know? Uh, thank you. Uh, so now we have some time for, for Marília. So Marília um, is a professor at law school at New, of University, uh, Federal University of Santa Catarina State, and her main areas of research are crimes of the powerful, media and crime, green criminology. Marília, you have also five to ten minutes to talk. Thanks. Thank you for joining us today. And the floor is yours. Thank you, Thais. I have prepared a small speech just for having the um, for being insecure about the, the language and the time. So <laughs> let's do that. 
And good afternoon to everyone. I'd like to thank Silvia for this kind invitation. And in her name, I'd like to compliment everyone on this panel and the audience. It is an honor to be here. First of all, congratulations to Tatiana and Renato for their courage and persistence with this project, which is so important. One remarkable accomplishment of this film is breaking the typical invisibility of what happens behind the prison walls. Rio Grande do Sul is one of the states where it is more, more difficult to get authorization to go inside the jail. So congratulations also for succeeding in this bureaucratic step for accessing this space. I also found brilliant that you gave the camera to the inmates. I only saw something like this in another documentary that's the Prisoner of the Iron Bars by Paulo Sacramento, which is I strongly recommend that everyone watches too. I'd like to say something on a personal, personal note. In the first minute of the movie, the prison director says that there is a jail to show to the university and there is the real jail. Well, I visited this jail for the first time in 2000, two decades ago, when I was one of the thousands of law students who visited each year. However, even this jail shown to the academics was shocking. It was the first time I understood the importance of questioning prisons as a control institution. And uh, having in mind that I only saw a small and misguised idea of that facility. I have many notes about the film, but uh, as we have only 10 minutes, uh, I would like to address one main question for now. That uh, is more a kind of interpretation inside my field of research, that's the crime of crimes of the powerful. So the question is, um, in the situation of central prison portrayed in the film, uh, is the situation of central prison portrayed in the film a result of the loss of control by the state? and then a failure of the Brazilian prison system, or does it exactly fulfill the finalities for which it was projected in the first place? I'd like to approach the second possible interpretation in the sense that for me, this film draws attention to different layers of state criminality, and it is a call for state accountability. Violence is in the background of each image and interview in the film central. However, when the politicians and the mass media use the word violence referring to public security, it is common that physical and individual violence uh, appear as the main example, like uh, homicides, robberies, rapes. Looking inside the jail, violence is usually described as fights between gangs. A wider frame for conceptualizing the word violence rarely comes into the debate. Throughout Brazil, social scientists and associations of relatives of people in prison have been disputed the concept of violence, showing that the formation of factions inside the prison system is due to state violence. So what can be considered is state violence? First of all, it is structural violence. If we take the concept of Johan Galton to he says that uh, structural violence uh, are like social injustices that deprive the population of their basic needs. Brazil is one of the most unequal in countries in the world. Last week, for example, two headlines called attention to this point. During the pandemic, 11 white men from Brazil were included in the Forbes list of billionaires. And also during the pandemic, we multiplied for three the number of people who are considered below the poverty line. Poor people in Brazil are more than two thirds black people. So structural violence is marked by structural racism too. In a post slavery and post colonial country, being black gives more chances of dying young or even not born since more black women die during pregnancy or because of complications in the delivery that, than white women. If you are black, you also have more chances of going to jail than going to the university. So uh, after this first uh, layer of state violence, uh, that's structural violence, we can call about uh, we can talk about institutional violence. And here you can talk about an necropolitics. It's not only to let die, but making die. And uh, the state make die in this is a policy of the Brazilian state, which uh, is not necessarily executed only by omission, but also by action. 
uh, first there is the treatment as enemies routinely given to the same group of citizens that are made vulnerable by structural violence. It could be represented by the use of public discourse, for example, to legitimize exceptions to the individual rights. Injustices in penal procedures, the over-imprisonment and the police violence are examples of this. And this week, another headline showed the history of a man who was in jail for 16 years without a judicial prosecution against him. And this is not an, an isolated case. Uh, the documentary perfectly shows the overpopulation of the central jail. And although in the last years the population in that facility decreased a little bit, there still are the double of people, at least the double of people, than the number of places. More than a half of those 4,000 people are still not convicted. The trial detention is not an exception if you are black and poor in Brazil. In the data about the whole country, one third of the imprisoned people were not convicted, and overpopulation is around 40%. In the last 30 years, the prison population increased seven times, while the general population increased only 25%. And the film also shows that, that black people are overrepresented in the central. While they are 16% in the general population of the state of Rio Grande do Sul, they are 30 3% in the prison. And if we make the general, if you take, uh, if we take the general data of Brazilian prisons, around two thirds are black people. Most of them were arrested for drug related crimes and crimes against the property. Uh, other violent consequences derived from prison overpopulation. For example, the precariousness of healthcare, the absence of hygiene, in many facilities, the lack of water to drink and to clean the body and the cells. The film showed that 89% of the deaths in central jail are due to health issues, mostly respiratory ones. Can you imagine what is happening now during the pandemic? The pandemic made these conditions way worse as the states uh, suspended the visits of relatives with at least two consequences. The visitors, who are almost the totality women, could not give them clothes, blankets, hygiene materials, and money to the prisoners. The visitors were not inside the jail once a week to reveal, for example, torture marks in the prisoners' bodies. One example of this tragedy is the deaths of six inmates in a facility of the state of Piauí for beriberi, that's a disease caused by the lack of vitamin B1. Torture is also a type of state crime, so inserted in the layer of institutional violence, but represented as direct violence. Camila Nunes Dias, who studies the case of PCC in São Paulo, and Marcelo Cipriani, who studies the factions of the central jail, argue that torture in different senses is the first ingredient to the creation of a faction. In the central jail, it is important to comprehend how the factions now work as an entity that dialogues with the state and controls most of the routine of that facility. The state profits from the deal they make with the gangs. The question is, if people have been tortured under the custody of the state, can we say that violence only comes from the fights between factions and simply let the state aside? This is what we see in the press, and this is what the governor, the, 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 all the people from uh, the state, the, the official uh, um, that occupy the, the official places to talk in name of the state, they, they say that the problem is the of violence inside the prison is about the fights between factions. Thus, how, how can we name in a criminological approach this process of outsourcing in which the state gives the factions permission to organize the jail and to torture and extort the relatives of prisoners? I think that the, that the concept of state-organized crimes can be useful to this task. Chambly defines state-organized crimes as acts defined by law, defined by law as criminal and committed by state officials in the course of their work as representatives of the state. As all types of state crimes, uh, 
denial is the first argument when the state is questioned about human rights violations. In the film, when the director of the facility says that after the deal with the factions, the rate okay. of murder decreased, even if they know that the deaths only changed the place and time, we're talking about a type of state denial. This was one of the denials that appeared in the answer that Brazil provided to the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights in 2013, when it was accused of human rights violations inside the central jail. Uh, the, the, this is a document full of state denial, to use the concept by Stanley Cohen. Even if the state partially recognized the problems in the facility structure, they denied one of the main accusations, that their own prisoners were responsible for organizing the safety of the pavilions. That's exactly what we saw in the documentary. The state is not only reinforcing the power of the gangs, but also it is part of this organization. And it is not only the executive power that must be accountable for the violations. How can the judiciary work normally as if the law were being enacted? During the pandemic, we could see exactly what most of the judges and ministers of the Supreme Court think about the prison system. And this is not just not real. We know by now how who profits from this criminal organization between the state and the gangs. The question is who pays the bill? from where the capital comes to the prison. Who supports the whole prison system in Brazil? I will follow my colleague Ana Flauzina in this topic. Uh, she argues in her studies that black and poor women support the whole prison system in Brazil. The only way found by the state to guarantee that the prison still operates and more and more people are still sent to the overcrowded jail, to, uh, jails is the workforce of the most oppressed people in Brazil. Uh, I will stop for now and uh, afterward we can go further in, he, in these uh, and other arguments that come from the, the public questions. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much for this, Marília. And um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> uh, so Jason, now it's, uh, it's your turn. Uh, welcome this panel. So Jason uh, War uh, is a senior lecturer in criminology and criminal justice at the Montfort University in the UK and he has conducted research in a number of criminal justice settings and uh, writing about prison and the pain of imprisonment and uh, narrative criminology and and more. Thank you <laughs> for joining us today Jason and please uh, uh, five to ten minutes if you can. <laughs> okay, cool. Uh, well, thank you for having me and thank you very much for inviting me. Um, um, uh, I was um, humbled to receive the invite and I was really glad um, to, to be able to accept and to, to actually um, get to watch um, 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 the documentary um, and actually, you know, um, 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 and so I'd like to thank you, thank the the documentary makers as well for for for, for actually putting this together and and and, and actually um, 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 being part of the event as well. I think one of the things that um, well, there's a there's about a hundred things I want to say, so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna do that. Um, <laughs> um, but I think one of the things that's important, and I think one of the things that's radically important, um, that we it, it, prisons are particularly hidden entities um, in our societies. You know, these are places where we often um, cast out individuals within our society. Our own, our own citizens are cast into these kind of the you know these horrific edifices um or these you know horrific kind of entities and then once we've put them there we tend to not think about them we tend to forget what happens to them and we tend to deny the implications of what happening or what is being done to them in our name and what the implications of that are for our society. You know, we tend to treat these as if they are somehow separate from our societies. And of course, they are not separate from our societies. They are um, inherent reflections and, um, you know, fundamentally hold a mirror up to the societies in which these institutions exist. And I think one of the things that I would like to kind of, uh, kind of comment on 
is that you know and kind of moving on from the idea of the kind of state violence is one of the things that we cannot separate out is the kind of very particular political economies that exist within particular societies and the manner in which those political economies become reflected in the logics and particularly the penal logics that we see being implemented in society i mean this uh, the, the 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 prison of the central is a, is a, is a is a, a prime example of this idea of these kind of penal economies of scale where you can run you know uh, uh you know what you do is you take a, an institution and you pack it to the rafters with people with people because doing so is actually much cheaper than building other um, um, uh, facilities or building newer facilities to house an increasing prison population and what you get one of the things that becomes quite interesting is when you look at those particular economies of scale and we see this in other kind of jurisdictions around the world you know this is um a lot of the prisons in North Africa, for instance, um, especially in uh, Tunisia and in Egypt and other kind of ju jurisdictions in those world, but also in in, in uh, the kind of former Soviet Union um, and some of the um, 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 kind of Eastern, commu you know, former communist countries um, where, you know, new kind of political economies have begun to dominate in those societies. We see these same kind of economic penal logics becoming manifest where what you do is you create these huge uh, kind of warehouses um, that have a secure perimeter but very very little kind of um, penetrative policing with inside the, the kind of structure of the uh, of the of the prison itself and what happens with that because they are much cheaper to run and there is this hidden nature to them so they're kind of the citizenry remain blind and in denial to what's happening in those environments what it means is that the the prison authorities the government authorities can just turn a blind eye to what happens and often what you then get is this situation where the very structure and the very penal logics of the environment create violence within so what you often see is in an environment and we see this very much in the in the um in in the documentary with the role of the um the pavilion bosses um as it were and um and the manner in which those pavilion bosses then create hierarchies of control within a within a system that is then controlled by state authorities so what you all of a sudden is you get the policing of um behavior you get moral policing within the environment that is being done by prisoners on prisoners with the tacit agreement of the structure of authority that exists over the top of that you get trade economic relations you know all prisons have economic relations occurring within them you know what i mean but all of a sudden if that economic relation is not done in a formal way by an authoritative system or by a legitimate or authoritative system then what you're going to get is less uh, formal um um, um economic relations occurring that often become much more exploitative much more violent much more um 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 um, um, um entrenched within the within the environment and of course the moment that starts happening with the lack of investment in the in the in the prison itself and the kind of denial that exists within society what you get is these deepening and deepening structures of 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 systemic and institutional violence that cannot be escaped from because all of a sudden what you know the only way that you could ever now stop the violence in that establishment is to raise it to the ground and move everyone out you know what i mean there is no way now of then dealing with the violence in that in that kind of um environment because the very layers of structures that exist both within and without cement it in in terms of its position and i think that that's fascinating that the documentary absolutely captures that um because these are ideas that kind of exist in kind of universally in terms of prisons literature and the kind of fallacies that we tell ourselves about prisons um but i think the documentary captures that quite horrifically but beautifully if, as it were thank you thank you so much for this uh, jason um, just a reminder to everyone that if you have any questions, you can start posting your questions 
in the chat function there. If you have a question to a person specific, you can just like please include the name or if you if you just have a general question, just feel free to do it. Uh, we are going to start now with our last uh, participant, which is Sylvia. Sylvia's your turn. <laughs> uh, so Sylvia is a lecturer in criminology at Nottingham Trent and she's also a researcher um, in Portugal and her main areas of research are crime and media, prison studies, crime, ethnicity and gender, intersectional approaches, social inequalities, violence, life course criminology, prison here, re-entry, <laughs> yeah, and so on. <laughs> Silvia, please. Thank you, Thais. Um, so just like Marilia, I have my own notes because I tend to talk too much. So <laughs> I will get strict to my notes, but I will make sure I, I look to the screen to make sure that I know that I'm, if I'm like crossing the line in terms of my 10 minutes, okay? <laughs> all right, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank everyone for being here today, uh, both my colleagues in this panel and everyone who is watching us online. Before I start my intervention, I want to make it clear that I never entered a Brazilian prison and I never studied the Brazilian prison system. Uh, my knowledge about prisons is related to the research I have been de developing in Portugal since uh, 2010, both in male and female prison settings. That said, when I'm looking at Central, I am looking at it with my own lens, okay? So I cannot completely dis distance myself from what I'm what's my research experience uh, from my own interpretations of what the, the prison system is or what I consider it should be um, and from um, my obviously limited understanding of the Brazilian prison system. Nonetheless, I believe that my lens can be valuable for comparative purposes, theoretical and analytical comparative purposes. The first point <laughs> I would like to make is that up to a certain extent, uh, there are many aspects shown about Prison Central that are not different from what we can find in many other prisons across the world. As there are, uh, as there are other elements that are very particular to the Brazilian um, reality. So aspects mentioned that are transversal uh, to various penal systems are, for example, the architectural apparatus of the prison, um, the infrastructural problems of the prisons, uh, the characteristics of the prison population, uh, like Marily already uh, mentioned, um, prison overcrowding, the negative impacts of prison uh, in prisoners, prisoners' families and the entire society, um, corruption, the control of prisoners through illicit and illicit drugs, and the visible fluxes between prison and society. All these aspects are very much discussed in penology literature as they result from philosophical and political ideals on how we must deal with crime, the criminal and the other. They appear reconfigured based on the Brazilian cultural and social reality, but they reflect what the prison is in itself, a violent place in many different levels. What seems to be very particular uh, to the Brazilian prison system from my perspective is this idea of the parallel state. By putting gang, putting gang members together, uh, controlling their own prison aisles, the power of gangs ends up being strength, strengthen, strengthened. So what was seen as apparently a protective measure at the beginning, as many people were being killed in prison by rival uh, gang members, ended up being a helper for the consolidation of these gangs. Therefore, in my perspective, and following what Marilia was also saying, I would say that Brazilian prison system is accomplice, as it is a platform for the facilitation and consolidation of these gangs. So I would uh, agree with the idea of the state violence and the state harm and crime. The second point I would like to discuss is the regions of front and backstage in prison, following the Goffmanian uh, um, concepts. The documentary starts with this very big prison, concrete walls, barbed wire, watchtowers, you know, we are used to see that. Uh, the architect this architectural apparatus serves the purposes of general deterrence as well as reinforcement of a philosophy that prisons are punitive and secretized places. Then if we zoom in, we can see overcrowding, sewer system problems, damaged cells, damaged ceilings, humidity and all of that. So many other problems. Despite being punitive and securitized, 
Most of the democratic world needs to guarantee some standards for their citizens, regardless of the financial situation. So worldwide, worldwide, we created several institutions to monitor and control what's happening inside prisons in terms of human rights. Therefore, prisons found ways to respond to international guidelines. In the face of being almost impossible to change prisons completely, for lack of investment, lack of political will, and many other reasons, regions of front stage and regions of backstage were created. So whenever uh, outsiders visit prison, like Marilia was saying, regions of front stage are presented, hiding the backstage regions where many times the most violent realities are performed. This was something I found in my own research as well. Prisoners would be the first ones to clearly identify what were the front stage regions and the backstage regions. Um, sometimes these regions are, re are configured and reconfigured in 24 hours, which make them more difficult to identify. During the day, it can be a waiting room. In the night, it can be a beating room, where prisoners are physically punished for their behavior, either by staff or even other prisoners. This can be particularly significant if we think about this documentary and the importance of visual criminology to study prison settings. Another point that I would like to make. Prisons are par excellence hidden places like um, Jason also mentioned. Um, so these are hidden places very much difficult to access and to conduct research on. Researchers, as many outsiders, will only have access to the front stages as if they spend, and if they spend some time in prison and gain trust of some prisoners and staff, they can have access to more sensitive information and to what happens in these backstage regions. Nevertheless, it is very easy to get div uh, uh, divergent voices. Being a staff member or being in administration or being a prisoner translates into very different positions. This was very evident in the documentary when staff says that prison is not a school of crime and prisoners say that prison is definitely a school of crime. Most of prison reports convey official information, which can be just a partial reality of what is going on in prison. So this documentary does something bolder and shows the images provided by the prisoners who films the prison from within. This approach can be groundbreaking in terms of demystifying some ideas around prison and the prisoner, as well as maybe, who knows, generate, generating accountability on what is going on inside prisons. I strongly believe that user-generated content that usually is used outside to publicize and denounce in social media the criminal justice practices, for example, with policing um, practices, can be flipped to publicize, denounce, and create awareness on what is happening on the inside in prisons. After all, we are in the era of the visual, and phones with cameras and prisoners with active profiles uh, on social media already exist. My concern about this is who is going to care to see or who is going to care to listen. Which leads me to my next point, the characteristics of the prison population that was already explored here uh, by Marilia very well. Um, so prisons house mostly young men from precarious economic backgrounds, from racial, ethnic and cultural minorities. The book Prison Prisons of Poverty from uh, Vacan shows how prison can be a partner of the state, encompassing a punitive crime control policy because the invisible hand of the market necessitates and calls forth the iron fist of the penal state. Manuel Feu da Silva, who Works, um, works for 12 years in central prison, says in the documentary, and I quote, I have found it all, but rich people, no. I still couldn't find rich people in prison. Everybody knows that prisons in Brazil was made for the poor. The poor are the only ones serving time in prison. Well, this is not only in Brazil, unfortunately. Punishing the poor is very much transversal to many penal systems across the world. As Wakan shows, the ascension of the penal state is a response to rise in social insecurity, not criminal insecurity. But when the focus is mostly on street crime, when the police believes that they are fighting crime by putting the street drug dealers in prison, for example, this is a fallacy, a big fallacy. Street drug dealers are extremely easy to be replaced by drug trafficking networks in a society overrun by poverty and social inequalities, even more so. Attacking street, uh, street uh, dealers will not solve the drug problem, 
nor it will be the continuing criminalization of the drugs in general, as the drug-related literature shows very well. Besides, we are clearly uh, observing the expansion of the penal state through the creation of new confinement places that are not even for criminals, such as administrative detention centers for migrants. So it seems like we are on a certain direction of being more punitive and more punitive towards the street criminal, the poor, the other, what we consider to be the other. More than thinking on solving the big type of crime or the actual impact this approach to prison and the criminalization of certain groups has in the society as a whole. Which leads me, leads me to my last point, and I think I'm on time. In the documentary, we can read that prisons are cheap for the state and expensive for the society. When the prison fails to address resocialization, rehabilitation or reintegration of the prisoner, in case of prison central even undermining this and promoting the criminal affiliation to gangs in a vicious and violent cycle, the entire, the entire society pays the price. This is evident for prisoners, this is evident for some academics, but it doesn't seem to be that evident for the society at large. People think that the more prison, the safer we are, when it is actually the opposite. People that are incarcerated they were many times already substituted in the outside, if we are, for example, considering the drug markets. And these people that were incarcerated, they will eventually leave prison. And even when they want to work and study and have a rather normative lifestyle, all the doors tend to close due to stigma of being an ex-prisoner. Also, there is a set of literature exploring the impact of incarceration in different generations as well pointing out how having a family member incarcerated increases the risk of ending up in prison. And we saw that in the documentary as well. If the prison fails to do something good with a prisoner, or if the state fails to address the real issues surrounding the criminal activity, then the outcome will necessarily be the same. Prisons can actually lead to more crime instead of decreasing crime. So instead of maintaining this punitive ideal or revenge ideal as presented in the documentary Central, Maybe we can do something better for all of us by reducing prison and investing more in our communities. And that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Celia. And, um, and thank you, everyone, for your input. Um, so please, just again, to remind everyone that if you have any questions, you can just post in the chat. And uh, if you have a specific question to a person, just uh, just uh, let us know, just include the name of the person that you are addressing your question to. I'm going to use the power of my position to start with the questions then. <laughs> um, and I have my first question is for Tatiana, Renato um, and Luca. I don't know if one of you, uh, whoever feels comfortable to reply to this. Uh, but I'm curious about how did you get the prisoners to record those scenes, you know? So I was wondering if you could just explain to, one, to us, like if the authorities knew about it, um, how was the negotiation to give them the cameras uh, for them to record and how long, like how many hours you have recorded and like how you selected things you know i think all this is so interesting so unique you know so different well uh we stay uh about two years to get it um uh, i went uh, about um to a uh, uh, 100 uh, days, more or less, because all the time I tried and uh, get asked the first time to to judge the judge to to get the permission to ask him because in the first time I I know that uh, if I don't put the camera in the hands of the prisoners, we don't have the documentary because um, they know, nobody can uh, go inside the, these uh, galleries. Uh, in, 
each gallery uh, from Faxon uh, had uh, more, more or less um, 400 people <laughs> there and no political, no um, agent, agent, agent uh, can go inside. Uh, they live together and uh, don't have uh, um, doors in, in the jails uh, and they stay you know, all the time together and nobody knows before puts the camera there how they live. Uh, so, uh, the, uh, in, when I start to, uh, to try to make a documentary, uh, I decided if that if I don't get it, I, I uh, we no have documentary because uh, the history was there. And uh, did you told before about uh, Prisioneiro da Grade de Ferro, uh, of uh, Paulo Sacramento? I uh, distribute. Uh, distribu distributed uh, the, that the documentary here in, in, in Porto Alegre, in Rio Grande do Sul, uh, 10 years ago. And, and uh, I, in the first time, I think it's different because he, the uh, uh, oficina, oficina de, um, de Paulo Sacramento, uh, gave uh, um, classes to the workshops uh, for uh, prisoners in that time. Uh, now I I can I could not do this, but I decided uh, show how they can um, do feel feel and today is easy easy to give and everybody knows how film uh, a little. Um, so uh, in the first time uh, I asked to ju uh, judge, uh, the first time one year later I get um, the permission from one, uh, uh, the, um, the black man that was director that is in Central, uh, because she, uh, he is uh, a sociologist, and so in that time, uh, two years after he stay all the time, when they stay all the time uh, in prison in Central, uh, but no exactly inside, uh, just in some place that uh, we get uh, permission and that you. To, um, the the um, the girl uh, told uh, you told me before uh, here is very difficult to get to uh, go inside of prison we don't have permi permission we never get this permission uh, but in that time uh, I uh, in three months that this man was in the was director. Uh, he gave me the chance, the chance to go to talk to the leaders from five uh, factions, factions, factions. Um, and uh, I stay, me and Renato um, stay with them uh, about in uh, five uh, meetings. Uh, I uh, stayed in five me meetings. Renato just get uh, stayed in two, <laughs> in two, and we uh, try and convince convince uh, them to to get uh, to put the camera. Two of these factions, uh, uh, gangs, <laughs> gangs. Uh, um, uh, accept, uh, take the, the camera, and that's, that's it. Sorry, I'm sorry, it's Tatiana. Cool,
uh, interrupting you. Uh, so, uh, how did you feel being a woman and uh, how comfortable did you feel in that environment? Uh, we are having this question in the audience here of Morag. Thanks for your questions, from Morag. Uh, so, she's asking, how did you feel uh, like being a woman in a very male oriented environment and also it helped you somehow the fact that you are a woman like to negotiate with the prisoners uh was very easy uh, because uh the woman in prison uh, here uh, in central or, or in another ones um uh is uh, is accept, accepted uh, for the prisoners because the woman uh the mother, the the woman, um, uh, wife, partner. Uh, exactly. Uh, um, uh, they stay all the time inside of prison, and so they have a respect. Uh, the, the, the very is very uh, intensive. The respect. Uh, that they have with women. I think, uh, because I was, I, I'm, I'm a woman, I had more uh, facility if I uh, was a man to get this. Okay. Thank you. Thank Obrigada, Tatiana. Um, I have a question for Marília as well. Um, so Marilia, uh, I think the documentary clearly shows the whole, uh, the role of the Brazilian authorities in letting things happen in that specific way and let the Presidio Central be run in that way. But I was wondering if you could talk a bit about Brazilian society, you know, the role of Brazilian society in keeping things in the same way, in accepting what happens there in accepting this general idea of a private revenge. Um, is this somehow an indication that Brazilian society is leaning to the far right, which actually makes sense in the context of us electing Bolsonaro as our president, you know, two years ago? Uh, like, so accepting the prison being at it is, is it an indication of, uh, of this far right politics? Thank you for the question, Thais. Very interesting. And um, well, uh, one thing that's very important to clear is that uh, the situation reported in this documentary is uh, far before uh, this ascension of far right. And I'm not talking that far right in the power is not a problem <laughs> for this issue specifically. I will talk about this. But it's interesting that the the mo, the, the um, biggest increase in in prison population in Brazil happened in during the left wing government, and uh, this is something that we are studying and reflecting for uh, at least ten years, trying to understand this process. Because, uh, of course, we are talking about something that is structural, because, for example, structural racism is something that you don't change uh, from a day to another. <laughs> it's something that takes a time to do something. And I think that the left gov left wing governments made something about this, for example, with the the insertion of black people into the universities. And uh, I think this is so important uh, uh, also because uh, it's, it's something uh, important to interpret the, the role of the criminal justice system in the perpetuation of racial uh, structural racism. And uh, we are we're say, seeing that uh, the inclusion of black people in the universities are allowing us to have another kind of uh, interpretation about this process of the, this increasing in the, the, the prison population. Uh, mostly black people uh, have places that are recruited by the, the, the system. Uh, but um, 
the problem, and I, I think Sylvia stated that before, uh, about the how the mass media, for example, show the, the drug trafficking as um, they create uh, uh, an image of the drug dealer as a whole bandit, as a whole criminal, terrible, and uh, and it, it it seems like uh, all the drug dealers and this would be uh, in this sense uh, the people that is in the prison for the mass media. They would be great drug dealers. They would be the ones who have these uh, guns that 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 are limited for the army and they have the guns to, to shoot the police, for example. This is the image that the media gave, gives to us. But uh, this is not uh, the reality. People who are in prison in Brazil for drug dealing, for example, they are all small drug dealers. And, uh, and they sometimes uh, have never take a gun in their, in their hands. So it's so disproportional, and this is in this. It's so uh, misguided the, the way in which the, the the mass media show this, and I think that society, uh, like this, is a figure that uh, also um, fits in the idea of uh, evil and good. It's something like um, manichaeistic. And it's easy for the society to understand this language. The bad people are there in jail. Good people are outside the jail. So it's something uh, so easy to understand. And uh, of course, politicians are using this for getting uh, symbolic power and for getting votes in the elections. And Bolsonaro is a good, uh, this is a perfect example of this. Because he, during his 30 years as a deputy at representative in the, the National Congress, he was elected with one only, only one, only one uh, idea that was, we have to put these criminals inside jail. We have to reduce the penal responsibility, responsibility age for the adolescents to go to jail. Because you, who are the good society, you must be protected. And those people who are bad people must die. And he is actually supporting a, a project, a bill in the Congress now that's for creating a, an exception for murder, for police murdering, uh, killing people without having any prosecution against them. That's actually what happens mostly. But now he wants to legalize this process. So uh, I think far right uh, is um, using this, um, this uh, easy way of dealing with criminal criminality, the, the ideas of criminality uh, for getting votes. And of course, this is related, but we can say that it's not far right politicians who created or who only uh, supported the idea that the prison resolves problems for a good society. I don't know if I answered you. I hope so. Yeah, no, thank you. Perfect, Marilia. Uh, so we have a question for Jason here in the in the chat. So uh, do you see any similarities between this prison and prisons in the UK? And also, do you think prisons problems in the global south is general could, in general could be attributed to historical legacies related to the global north? Unmute yourself, please. <laughs> OK, uh, yeah, good questions. Um, I'll tackle. Yeah, so I'll take them in order. Um, did I see parallels? Yes, definitely. And I think as as, um, um, uh, as Sylvia said there and as Marilia has also said that there are some universals when it comes to um, the kind of structuring of systems of power within within prisons and the manner in which you then get um, 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 not only does the, the you know the 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 the, the, the kind of 
the, the manner in which the everyday of the prison becomes kind of manifest in the minds of different individuals. So I think one of the things that was quite interesting in this documentary was so for Pat Carlin, um, um, uh, wrote a book uh, uh, many years ago where she used the idea of um, the imagined prison, the imagined penalties. And what she argued in that is that actually what you get is particular ideas of what the prison is and what the prison can achieve and what the can prison do exists as a kind of buffer in the minds of those who are in authoritative positions in the institution. And it becomes a rhetorical device that kind of which shapes their professional practice. But often that rhetorical device has little reality compared to what you see in the actual kind of the day to day life of the prison. And I think that was really evident in the in the video there. Um, it was quite interesting. There was the two guards who were who were interviewed most often kind of highlighted the distinction between that reality that exists or the rhetorical reality that exists in the kind of penal governance and for people outside of the prison and um, the, the kind of the day to day reality that is, exists inside. You've got that kind of that 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 being really represented in their in their kind of commentary. But also, I think, you know, one of the things that we often forget about prisons as horrific uh, uh, environments as they are, they are domestic environments. And, and the kind of the stuff of everyday life happens there. Um, and I think what it was quite easy, you know, the, the, the concerns over basic needs, over food, over health, over hygiene, over, over relationships, over um, conflict. Why are people worried about their, you know, their mum? You know, when that poor lad's talking about, you know, my dad died here. But, you know, when my mum comes to visit me, if it wasn't for my mum, I'd basically have nothing but it's horrendous for her to come here because it reawakens trauma. You know, not only is she worried about her, but she's got the memory of her husband, blah, blah, blah. You know, and what you've got is this, this domestic life being performed in these environments. And I think, you know, one of the, the one of the things that we see in the kind of politicization of prisons, um, and Marilla has just spoken about this uh, wonderfully, is that, you know, often what you get in media and the, in the politics around prison is, this this you know the, the 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 kind of the shaping or the framing of prisoners as these monstrous entities these monstrous individuals within our societies you know these folk devils that exist amongst us but really you know anyone who does prisons research knows that you know and anyone who goes into prisons you know what you've got inside prisons is the broken the unhealthy and the desperate you know what I mean? And really, you know, what we end up with in prisons is the people who have been most ill served in society are the people who end up in prisons. Um, and I think, you know, there is a universal <laughs> in terms of that, certainly within kind of, um, 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 you know, the prisons that I that I research in the, here in the UK. You know, you see the exact kind of, um, um, um you know the the echoes of the population are very very similar so even though you know looking at the prison of the central is an extreme kind of example you know there are definite parallels on every single level uh, and i think this is something that sylvia noted um in her talk taking your second point or the second part of that question absolutely i think one of the most toxic elements of kind of northern european colonial conquest has been not only the kind of toxic elements of the political economy that we kind of um, um, spread around the world, but also our penal fetish, you know, this absolute fetish for punitive systems of control and of, of, of systems of control. And I think absolutely when you look at <clears throat> systems of control, when you look at prison systems, when you look at penal systems that exist in the global south, often what you get is those colonial echoes. Um, and I think one of the things that he said there is, um, you know, what you've got here is a prison that was built in the 19th century that is still operating as if it is in the 19th century. Um, and I think that that's, that's the case, you know what I mean? Um, um, and I, so, I, yeah, I absolutely think that, you know, what you see, what you see there is, a, is an echo uh, and a leftover you know, and the, you know, the, the detritus of colonialism, definitely. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Uh, Sylvia, we have a question for you uh, in the chat. 
So you bring up a great point about reallocating funds from prisons to society. Do you believe that the media outweighs the importance of these funds? In other words, if mass media still acts a divider between pro-social and anti-social, do you think that redistribute funds would be enough to start changing the minds of society on crime and deviance? Great question, Jack. <laughs> and that's a very difficult question to answer, <laughs> I would say. Well, when we, when it comes to media, it's 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 a, a different territory. Um, but what we so we know that media tends to portray the criminal in a certain way and also the prison system in an, a certain way. So but we also so in a, in a, this um negative way and in uh, the manichaeist way that like Marilia was was saying. But if we consider that also most media, uh, especially the mainstream media, will uh, give voice to politicians and to the ones that are in power, if this is something that comes from someone that is in power, like governments and all, maybe, maybe media can have a, a, a role in um, helping um, not justify, but kind of uh, let this idea of um, funding the societies and not so much the prison system to come along. But I think we still have a long way to go before we reach that position. Um, as Jason was mentioning and, and also Marilia, the penal um, populism and all the, the, the penal ideal, uh, ideal is pretty much uh, strong uh, and it's reified in our society. So it's very difficult to deconstruct. Um, like I was saying, it, 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 for people that studies, for researchers, for um, many academics, it's so obvious that the, that prisons are more, um, that have a, 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 a a strong impact, a neg negative impact um, on prisoners, prisoners' family, and in an entire society. But then for the society, it's not at all um, obvious that prisons are not something that um, is beneficial for the society. They see prisons as something um, that should exist and should be uh, invested on because we don't want, you know, we don't want to have street crime. We don't want something robbing us or we don't want to have that person living next to us, right? So we want to get rid of this, um, this undesirable uh, populations. So before we can actually have the media discussing this, of course, mainstream media, because we already have some alternative media discussing um, abolitionist perspectives, uh, prison abolitionist perspectives. Uh, if we want a mainstream media to discuss this or to even bring this into the debate, we have to go a long way before with uh, society at large and the governments. So, and because in many countries like Brazil and not only, um, the state kind of benefits from having this system, I don't know if we have uh, what it takes to start the actual change. I hope I answered you, Jack. That was a tricky question. <laughs> uh, we have in the chat also another question. Thank you, Silvia. We have in the chat another question for Tatiana and Renato. So do you know, maybe through your contacts there, how is the situation in Presidio Central now? How has the pandemic affected life uh, in prison? Well, uh, maybe I will ask it to Renato <laughs> uh, as well. Um, we don't know exactly because uh, we don't have news about inside of prison in Brazil. Uh, Renato, uh, eles perguntam o que que qual é o o que que acontece o que que está acontecendo agora no, no presídio central e principalmente com relação à pandemia. Eu disse que a gente não tem notícias, praticamente tem muito poucas notícias. Thais, can you translate? I can translate, Renato, you just need to uh, uh, tiro mu, tá no mudo. 
pode ter precisa tornar é. Bom, Thaís. Uh, bom, Thaís, uh, peço uh, que repassem eles. As informações do sistema penitenciário do Brasil, na atualidade, até em virtude da pandemia, elas estão uh, bastante fechadas, né? Okay, uh, second, Renato. Uh, so, Renato is saying that the, the news about what's happening inside the prison in Brazil at the moment during the, the pandemic, they, they are quite closed, quite restrict. So, people don't know, basically, what's happening inside. Pode continuar. É, é certo. Uh, uh, quando as, as maiores, infor, uh, maiores não, mas as, as informações, melhores informações, sempre nos chegavam por familiares e presos. Mas, como as visitas estão suspensas, também esse acesso está sendo dificultado. Ok, so Renato is saying that usually they would get some news from people like uh, prisoners' relatives, but at the moment, as we don't have people visiting uh, Presidio Central, it's difficult to get to know what's happening there. Mais alguma coisa? É, não, aí com isso não se sabe ao certo entre os presos quantos, quantas mortes já ocorreram. Se sabe dos trabalhadores, né, agentes penitenciários, mas não se sabe Quantos presos já morreram em virtude quantos, da pandemia? Quantos agentes penitenciários, Renato? Tem uma ideia? Uh, parece que no país é em torno de 350. Uh, ok, então so Renato está dizendo que eles têm uma ideia de quantos pessoas que trabalham em prisão morreram durante a pandemia. É em torno de 350 pessoas que trabalham em prisão em todo o país. Mas eles não têm uma ideia do número de prisioneiros, porque, yeah, basicamente... Yeah, just complementing Renato's uh, answer. Yeah, it's like uh, difficult to get information at this point in Brazil. It's more through the media consorts than through the state itself about about the pandemic because the state is trying to hold uh, the information as well as they can. Obrigada, Renato. Uh, thank you. <laughs> we have uh, we have another question here. Actually, is a question for Marília. Uh, Uh, do it uh, due to the absence of prisoners human rights never have united nations or any other organization ever tried to intervene in the prison system thank you for the question it's uh, jean paulo garrido i think uh, just uh, uh, before talking about this question i just would like to complement the the answer by tatiana and the uh, Renato, because in the university uh, we created in the last April, April of the 20, uh, 2020, uh, a platform in um, in a website that's COVID nas prisões. After that, I, I can put it there in the chat and a profile in Instagram and Twitter, in which we we are trying to. Uh, check information about what is happening inside the prison, prisons, prison facilities in Brazil. And uh, we, we are trying to cover all, the whole territory and uh, because of this we have also uh, two other universities engaged in this project, that's the uh, Universidade de Brasília and Universidade uh, Estadual de Feira de Santana in Bahia. And uh, we we are posting almost every day information about different states. And uh, what can I, what I can say is that um, the the main problem we have right now is uh, under reporting uh, of the cases because they are not testing uh, in the inmates. And uh, the, the information the Ministry of Justice provided is in a website in which they they have um, um, the, the news, I can say, the data provided by the states to the Ministry of Justice. And it is almost daily uh, updated. But uh, when we go to uh, and ask for information directly in the states, they don't say if, for example, the number of, of people that's contaminated with the vi virus 
um, when they say the number of people, they don't say uh, in many cases the number of tests and the type of test and when the test were, were, uh, was applied. So uh, it's very difficult to, to deal with these data they provide. And about the deaths in prison, uh, there is a, a number, and I, I, I saw it uh, yesterday, that's uh, 152, I think it was, uh, the number yesterday uh, in this uh, website. I can, I can also uh, put the, the, web, the link here. And, uh, but the problem is the same. Uh, people is dying, and uh, for the, the the certificate of the death uh, have the, the that the cause of the death as COVID-19, uh, they must have done the test. If they don't, <laughs> we don't have the register. We don't have the the, the right number. So uh, it's we we know it's underreported. And a good example is Sao Paulo. We, we are trying to investigate the numbers of Sao Paulo because day by day we have numbers, uh, one more or two more deaths uh, between the uh, servant, servers, the uh, public servers of the, the uh, uh, prison system. And the po prison population that's the hugest in the Brazil uh, are lower, the rates of deaths are lower than the servers. And it's obvious <laughs> that's underreported. It, it's it just doesn't make sense. And but we don't have uh, how to say exactly that it's underreported because we don't don't have the data. We don't have anything. And uh, the relatives of prisoners uh, actually gave us many information during this this time. Even if they were were not going to the inside the jail because the visits were suspended, uh, many of them have contact with their relatives with cell phones, because it's forbidden, of course, for the people in jail to have cell phones. But they have cell phones. You you, you could see that in the documentary too. And uh, we we received uh, photos, we received videos, and uh, and the, the relatives were uh, disparate. They were uh, absolutely uh, freaking out because of the situation. They they couldn't know any information uh, about the the way in which uh, the the healthcare was. was uh, working inside the, the jail. And when they had the information, the information was astonishing because of these, uh, the deaths and, the, and the, the people, well. And there is another problem because uh, inside the jail, there are some, some uh, diseases that are endemic that we don't have many cases of tuberculosis, for example, in uh, outside the jail. I don't know if the word is tuberculosis, <laughs> but, uh, and inside the jail, there is 35 times more cases of tuberculosis than outside the jail. And this is a respiratory disease. So, uh, of course, people in jail have, most of them have comor comorbidities. Comorbidities? I don't know, I don't know how to say it, the word. Uh, <laughs> and uh, Conditions, underlying conditions. Yeah. Underlying conditions, okay. And, uh, and uh, and what what I am concerned the, the most is about the judiciary and uh, already uh, answering the the question by Jean Paul. Um, when we we think about accountability, uh, it's necessary to understand how people who who, who could uh, have this position of controlling the executive like control of powers uh, is the judiciary. And it's interesting that uh, in 2015, the Supreme Court uh, recognized that the Brazilian system, all the whole Brazilian um, uh, prison system was uh, unconstitutional, was under unconstitutional uh, situation. <laughs> and uh, it's interesting because the, the whole um, 
decision brings many data and uh, they cite uh, the central Fas tourism facility they cite many other facilities and they they say it all letters <laughs> that uh, the, oh, the whole prison system in Brazil is unconstitutional. But the same Supreme Court in decisions they made afterward, for example, uh, and, and uh, before it too, they, for example, decided that um, the word reincidência, that re how can I say? Recidivist. Yeah. The recidiv the recidivism. Recidivism uh, would would not as a, a a condition to increase the penalty for the one who is being judged individually judged. It uh, is constitutional. It is constitutional to uh, to say to the people if you are at the server time. Uh, because of a crime you committed before. Now you have to pay more time because of this, because you did not um, resocialize yourself. It's the same STF, the same Supreme Court that say that the whole prison system in Brazil is unconstitutional, say that people have the obligation of resocialize themselves inside the jail because if they don't they will have a greater uh, biggest a bigger uh, sentence uh, the next time uh, he or she will be judged so it's it's so contradictory because uh, they in the in this system in which the judiciary should should uh, like control the the have the uh, outside control uh, to the executive um, human rights violations. They just say that nothing is happening when they are judging other issues that's not uh, uh, the whole penitentiary system. When they are judging, judging individuals, they say, well, you are, uh, you, you have to, to, to go to the jail <laughs> and it's okay. Uh, so it's it's a problem because uh, the, I, I think that and we know uh, that the international uh, criminal justice system uh, always work when we have, uh, for example, the proof that, that of the omission of the 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 powers the intern powers uh, for judging these violations. And here, what we are we are say, seeing is that uh, we have an, an, a great omission uh, with this the work of the Supreme Court, and maybe this is a, a, a kind of uh, point to start these other possibilities of control. And there is this uh, denounce to the the commission, the American Commission on Human Rights, that was taken in 2013. But this is only um, symbolic. We can say that inter intervention is a possibility, and I don't know if it's uh, desirable also. But uh, I don't know. I think that uh, the pandemic. Um, only uh, showed uh, better the, situ the terrible situation we already had before the pandemic inside the jail, and that we don't have any transparency, any kind of transparency, and uh, well, this is why this film is so important. Thank you, thank you so much, Maria. I have two questions here in the chat that I think I'm going to just ask together because they are related to each other that are for actually for everyone. And I think probably is going to be the last bit because we are almost running out of time. So for everyone, Ian uh, is asking, several of you drew attention to the power of visual methods exhibit in the documentary. Do you think these methods may be a tool 
to begin to change the conversation if we can reach the right audiences. And then Paul Birmingham includes uh, related to your question, where, if at all, can we find calls for optimism in this documentary and specifically in making visible the brutal reality of prison life in Brazil? Does this open up new possibilities to make prisons more humane or for resistance to state violence or to build new relationships between incarcerated populations and wider society? Thank you all for your talks. So any of you that feels like Jason, please. Sorry, remember to turn my microphone on. Um, I think there's two things here. Um, I think the first thing that we often need to do is in order to really communicate um, or to, to really start to reframe public discussions around prisons, it is absolutely necessary to kind of collapse the distance between what happens in these hidden institutions and what exists in the kind of public imagination. Um, and I think, you know, we, we need to collapse that distance, you know what I mean? We, and, and, and documentaries like this uh, and other good quality documentaries that we've seen in kind of other prison systems around the world are one way of doing that. Um, but also, I think, you know, we, we've had a long history of kind of, well, not a long history, but, you know, probably about 20, 20 plus years now of um, um, a kind of visual criminology, really, where, you know, we've had these, um, you know, the ideas of actually exposing the image um, to the public um, and, and, and the, the imagery of places and, and of social control, for instance, that can then help to um, in some way collapse that distance. I think one of the things that I've been involved with just recently is actually um, uh, a kind of an extension of the ideas of visual criminology is actually into a, a, a sensory criminology, which is actually about expanding that understanding of penal environments beyond just the visual, but also into the kind of understanding about how prison sounds, what it smells like, what it feels like, what it, you know, and those kind of elements. So actually, once we can broaden it out just beyond the, the, the visual to other kind of sensory components, then we can collapse that distance between the kind of agnotology, you know, the imposed ignorance of public discourse and the reality that exists in the prison. Um, and it's only when we are able to collapse that distance are we going to begin to be able to change the narratives and the perceptions and the understandings of the public. Because we know that when you inform the public, they are not as punitive as they are when they're kept ignorant of issues. Um, um, but the problem is, is that they are currently kept ignorant. The spectacle of the prison exists over there, not, not, not in here. Um, um, and that's the barrier that I think we need to break. And I think documentaries like this go some way into breaking that, 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 that barrier a little bit. So I think there is hope, but we have a damn long way to go. Can I step in uh, following what Jason was just said? Um, I was talking, well, it was a conversation with a friend this day, one of these days, and she was saying, well, I have something closer to what it is, or I, I can feel closer to what a prisoner uh, feels like because I've been uh, in lockdown for too many <laughs> days now because of the pandemic. So it seems like people are questioning what it is to be locked uh, in lockdown or being at the, in home arrest because of uh, the pandemic. And of course, that started an, an entire conversation of that's not what it is to be in prison, because being in at home, being in in your own space with your comfort, with the with the people you love, that's definitely when when that's the case. Of course, that's definitely not uh, the same as being in prison. Uh, so it's interesting that some people will think that being at home or being secluded at home will be anything similar to actually uh, being in prison. But because, but uh, regarding that, I just recall um, what Bloomstein uh, wrote about the power of documentaries. Uh, Bloomstein, for the people that don't know him, is a, um, a British um, producer. He produced the eight-part series, Strange Ways. 
uh, and he, he, he explored um, the British prison life um, and all the emotions around uh, the prison system, uh, the British prison system. And he says, or he strongly believes, that documentaries have the ability to alter entrenched attitudes um, if the complexity of the criminal conduct is allowed to be developed in documentary form. So if the documentary is, avail is able to deconstruct all the complexities, all the layers that we can see in prison and that and also in the criminal, because usually we just look to criminals just as, you know, this hideous person and not more than that. If we are able to demystify this idea of the criminal, then maybe we can change the way people think about prisoners and think the, the and change the ways that uh, people can think about uh, prisoners and prisons. But other, um, other researchers are not that optimistic as Bloomstein and uh, consider that the empathy inherent in the documentary process may only be felt by those that are already um, sensitive or they are already share the narrative's perspective and have pre-existing sympathies with its subjects. So people that would just already be um, uh, they already sympathize with pri with uh, prison related issues or have a different way of looking to the world or looking at these issues would more probably change the ways they uh, look at this reality, not so much people that don't share this uh, ideal. So, of course, in here we have several studies and several perspectives and we can either be really hopeful or not that <laughs> hopeful in terms of uh, what can uh, so what would be the impact of documentaries and other visual um, um, sources in changing our perspectives and our ideas about the prison systems? That's my five cents. Oh, <laughs> you, thank you, Sylvia. I actually have to finish this session now because it's already 6 p.m. Unfortunately, uh, I think we could talk about this documentary for hours and hours and hours. <laughs> and it would never end uh, so much to talk about. And it's such a great, great piece of work. Uh, Tatiana, Renato, well done. This is absolutely great. This documentary just shocks us so much. You know, even if you are born there and used to the situation, it is still shocking to see everything that happens in Brazilian prisons in Central. Uh, thank you so much. Muito obrigada, uh, all of you, for, for for being here today. Uh, obrigada, Renato, Tatiana, Luca, Marília, Jason, Silvia. Uh, this was really great. I hope everyone enjoyed. And uh, and thank you, everyone in the audience that sent their, their questions. Um, and that's it. So, yeah, take care, uh, everyone. And uh, really good to have you here today. Bye. Are you guys staying behind on purpose? <laughs> yeah, I didn't know if anyone wanted to continue a chat or whatever. So yeah. yeah, I am actually I am staying behind. I wanted to thank everybody as well. I mean, we had a head of a talk at uh, 20 minutes before we started that. So yeah, I forgot to apologize for the technical issues at the start. But I think uh, yeah, it was so productive afterwards that I hope he's worthy. Yeah, Ian, yeah. you might want to stop recording now. You know. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I forgot about that. Well, good point. <laughs>